Here we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome Christoph here for today for his uh, Astina talk uh, on your developments in quantitative MRI. But Christoph is an expert in MRI. He uses post mortem brain tissue and compares histopathology and other measures with the MRI signal of quantitative MRI scans. And he has made significant contributions to our myelin iron in the brain influence and the MRI signal. He did his PhD with Stefan Ruppel at the Medical University in Graz. And in 2018, he received an Erwin Schrödinger Award to do postdoctoral studies in my lab at the University of British Columbia. So I hit the checkboard there for sure. And during that time, he advanced our knowledge how iron oxidation, iron concentration, and tissue architecture influenced the MRI signal. And since 2022, he has been assistant professor for computational radiology at the Medical University in Innsbruck. I'm looking forward to this talk and uh, over to you, Christoph. Thank you, Alex, for your introduction and welcome everybody to my talk today about some new insights into quantitative MRI of the brain. So normally when we think of MRI, we think of weighted images which have different image contrast based on a variety of MRI sequence, which are available at the MR system. And they generate specific image contrasts, as you see here, which all highlight different aspects of the underlying tissue and are the basis for the routine diagnosis based on image contrast between normal tissue and disease tissue. But furthermore, we have a large variety of quantitative MRI methods. They allow us now to compute or to generate a more quantitative image where we can measure specific um, areas inside our tissue, which was imaged and assess values which then can um, be correlated to underlying tissue constituents or specific uh, measures of interest, such as water content, iron or myelin, or tissue architecture. So the question now is, how can we get from purely weighted images to quantitative images? And therefore, I want to give a short uh, overview of the most uh, common uh, quantitative MRI methods and also the one which I used in this uh, project, which I wanted to show you. And therefore, I show you some uh, basic steps which are typically be done to get from the weighted to the quantitative image. So in general, the MR signal, which we measure, depends on a variety of different properties and phenomena. So basically on the magnetization of the spins in the tissue, relaxation properties of different tissues, flow effects, perfusion effects, diffusion, the susceptibility of the tissue, and so on. And if we want to assess some quantitative properties of our tissue, we first have to select an MR parameter, which is specific mm -hmm. to this property of interest. This could be, for example, be the water content, iron content, or myelin. Then we typically acquire different images with different weightings. So we acquire multiple images with different settings of the sequences and then use uh, specific signal models and the multiple acquired images to compute now quantitative maps of the selected parameter. And then finally, with this quantitative MRI map, we can now perform some image analysis and further on statistics to compare healthy versus diseased uh, tissue in specific areas. So 
let me start with the quantification of the T1 relaxation time, which is one fundamental property in MRI. And therefore, in the simplest way, we acquire multiple T1 weighted images, which you can see have all a different image contrast. And with the signal equation and fit of the signal model, we can compute a quantitative map, a quantitative T1 relaxation map of the brain. The same holds true for the T2 and T2 star relaxation times. So we acquire again images with different weightings. In this case, with two different sequences, first with a gradient echo sequence for T2 star or spin echo sequence for T2. Again, we acquire different weighted images, fit the signal model and get the quantitative map. Another method which I used during this project is the so-called myelin water imaging. Myelin water imaging is based on the T2 properties of tissue and is acquired by measuring uh, a multi-echo spin echo sequence with typically more than 48 echoes to compute a T2 distribution. And in this T2 distribution, different uh, tissue types have a different T2 uh, relaxation time. And as you can see here, for example, in brain tissue, myelin water, which is the water which is trapped inside the myelin sheets. And this myelin sheet is around the axon. So it's like an isolating of the nerve fibers has a short specific T2 time in the range of 10 to 40 milliseconds. Whereas intra and extracellular water has a much longer T2 time of 40 to 200 milliseconds. And based on these physical properties, we were able with this method to generate uh, the so-called myelin water fraction, which is now a measure for myelin. The last method, which I want to show you, is the so-called quantitative susceptibility mapping, QSM, which calculates the tissue magnetic susceptibility, which is a physical properties from phase images, which are acquired with MRI. And here you see such example of a raw phase image, which is normally not usable in this stage. So therefore we first have to unwrap the phase image then perform a background field removal, and finally solve an inverse problem to get to the quantitative susceptibility. And for all these uh, steps, there are a variety of different methods available. So as you saw, we have now a whole a broad spectrum of MRI methods available. And now we can ask what causes this image contrast, which is different depending on the method. And when we now select a region of interest, for example, and have three different uh, quantitative measures, we have different values. But what do these values tell us now? So basically, the MR contrast and quantitative parameters in the brain are mainly influenced, for example, by water content, lipids, macromolecules, myelin, as shown before, iron and other metals. So we have different tissue constituents, which all contribute in a different way, of course, to now these quantitative measures. And in this talk, I will focus on two of them. The first myelin, which is essential for uh, high signal conduction in nerve fibers because of its isolating function and iron and other metals. These two will be the main uh, tissue constituents, which I will focus in the next uh, slides. So in general, iron and myelin are two um, constituents which are really important to ensure a normal brain function. So they are involved in several processes 
and they both depend on age. So with increasing age, the iron content is increasing, but also myelin content increases with age. And both vary across different brain regions. So for iron, we have the highest uh, concentration in deep gray matter structures, whereas for myelin, the highest myelin content is in white matter. And both are altered in various, various disorders. So for example, in multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer or Parkinson's disease. And here's an example of a post-mortem brain of a healthy subject stained for iron on the left and the browner the staining the darker the higher the iron content and here on the other side you see the corresponding ms brain again with iron staining and you can already see that we have two effects in the deep gray matter structure we have a strong iron staining intensity indicating that there is an increase in iron but on the other hand in white matter, there is a decrease in the staining intensity, indicating a decrease of the iron content. And on the other side, the same brain in a myelin stain, we see again the healthy brain with blue indicating high myelin content, the darker, the higher the myelin content, and the corresponding MS brain showing a uh, a decrease in this myelin staining in white matter. So we see that iron and myelin content of tissue can be a biomarker and used to diagnose different diseases or for, uh, for treatment response or disease progression. So can we now measure iron and myelin content using quantitative MRI? And for that, there are several MRI methods available, which are most of them are validated and allow to compute specific quantitative MRI parameters, which are sensitive to the underlying iron and myelin content of the tissue. And I will show you now the most, two most common uh, methods, which is R2 star mapping, as heard before, or QSM for iron content. So here you see an R2 star map, where you see the brighter, the intensity, the higher R2 star. And with a validation in a post-mortem experiment, there was found a linear correlation between the R2 star value and the underlying iron content. So you see in, in comparison to this histology slide, the higher the iron content of the tissue, the higher the R2 star value. And the same for myelin. Here we have the myelin water fraction. The brighter the pixel, the higher the myelin content. Also, again, validated using a postmortem experiment. And again, we see this linear correlation. The higher the myelin content of the tissue, the higher the myelin water fraction looks very easy. During my Schrödinger Fellowship at the lab of Alex Rauscher in Vancouver, mm -hmm. I investigated in more detail the effect of iron and different iron forms on quantitative MRI measures. So in the first experiment, we asked us how strong is now this effect of iron, or in this case, the special effect of different iron forms, on a variety of quantitative parameters. And therefore, we designed a specific postmortem experiment. We used formally fixed brain tissue, as you see here from four different cases, and separated each brain slice into two parts. The upper part of each slice underwent an iron extraction. So this tissue was treated to extract iron out of the tissue and the lower part was kept in formalin as reference. Furthermore, we used four additional samples, brain slices from the same subject. Again, the sample was split into two parts, whereas the upper part underwent an iron reduction. 
where three plus iron was uh, converted to two plus without uh, changing the iron uh, content. And again, the lower part of each slide was kept in formalin as reference. Then we acquired quantitative MRI prior this tissue treatment and after tissue treatment and acquired the quantitative relaxation rates are one or two or two star, magnetization transfer ratio, myelin water imaging, and QSM. To uh, validate our experiment and see if these tissue treatment procedures were successful, we performed histology for myelin and iron staining. And furthermore, we used mass spectroscopy to measure the iron content in this tissue treatment solution to really see if we could successfully extract iron out of the tissue. So let's look into the results of our histology. So here you see the myelin staining. Again, blue indicates the myelin and the darker, the more myelin. And again, on the upper part of each slice, we see on the left, the iron extracted part and on the bottom, the formalin reference part. And you can see that the myelin content was not affected by the iron extraction. The same for the iron reduction on the right. So on the top part, the treated tissue part, compared to the reference, there was no change in myelin content. So myelin content was not affected by our tissue uh, treatment procedures. And now in comparison, the iron staining, you could see that after iron extraction, the staining intensity decreased, indicating that there was a decrease in iron content. We had some tissue, uh, some samples where the staining was absolutely absent. So really a strong uh, extraction of iron was uh, possible. And on the right, the iron reduction did not change the total iron content of the tissue. So the iron stayed inside the tissue, but just was switched from more three plus to towards more two plus iron. This was further validated using mass spectroscopy. As you can see here in red, this is the iron content in the tissue treatment solution. So the first data points showing high iron content now indicate that after already two days, a lot of iron was extracted out of the tissue, which was then further decreased with ongoing treatment uh, duration. And in compared to uh, the iron reduction procedure shown in blue, we see that no iron was extracted out of the tissue in this solution, indicating that the total uh, amount of iron stayed constant and was not uh, affected by this procedure. Now let's look into the MR results of the iron extraction uh, sample. So when we look at R1, we see that after iron extraction, R1 strongly decreased in both in white matter and cortical gray matter. Same for R2, also decreased in both white and gray matter, as well as R2 star. And now, MTR, we saw an increase in MTR after iron extraction and a decrease in myelin water fraction. And so when we think back of our results from histology, where we saw no change in myelin content after iron extraction, a pure MR investigation would indicate now that in the case of MTR, myelin content uh, would increase. And in the case of the myelin water fraction, myelin content would decrease. But we can think back. Uh, histology showed us that there was no change in myelin content, only a change in iron. So as you can see, 
all of the assessed parameters did change after a change in total iron content. Now let's look at the results of the iron extraction part. When we look at R1, we saw no change after iron reduction. R2 and R2 star did decrease after an iron reduction and MTR and myelin water fraction did not change. So again, when we think back on the histology results, we saw that an iron reduction did not change the total iron content of the tissue. But MR indicates a decrease in R2 star and R2, which could be transferred or interpreted as a decrease in iron content, which was in that particular experiment not the case. So with that, we could show that iron had a really strong effect on quantitative MR measures and is really uh, more than just an increase or decrease in iron content. Also the oxidation state can strongly influence this iron related MR measures. So only in that case, only R2 and R2 star were sensitive to this change in oxidation state. A second big project uh, was the investigation of the effects of white matter fiber structures on various quantitative parameters. So for that, we have to keep in mind that the microstructure affects our measured MR signal and therefore also quantitative MR parameters. And usually we can have some isotropic structure where we have no specific or no uh, main direction, for example, inside a voxel of the underlying structure compared to anisotropic microstructure where we have a strong uh, oriented structure, which could be caused by tendons, ligaments, cartilage, or myelinated nerve fibers. And when we think now of an MRI uh, examination and the patient lies in the scanner with the head and then we have the orientation of the main magnetic field of the scanner in a specific direction. And now every fiber bundle inside the brain has a distinct orientation in respect to this magnetic field of the scanner. And using uh, diffusion tensor imaging, we can now calculate the angle of the uh, fibers in respect to the main magnetic field for all voxels inside the brain. And this leads us then to uh, fiber angle maps indicating areas where the main fibers are uh, aligned with the B0 field in blue versus areas where we have a 90 degree uh, deviation of the main fiber direction to the magnetic field depicted in red. And so with this method to generate these fiber angle maps, we can now compute fiber angle dependent MR parameters. For example, for R2 star, we plotted now R2 star over the entire white matter of the brain and grouped the R2 star depending on the underlying fiber angle. And we see here in areas where the fibers are aligned with the field, we have lower R2 star values than in areas where the fibers are perpendicular to the underlying field where the R2 star values are higher. And the dashed line represents uh, the global white matter mean if we would ignore this fiber orientation dependency. And with that uh, method, we now ask if the orientation of this white matter fiber also affects the estimation of myelin content using quantitative MRI and in particular using myelin water imaging. 
Therefore, we designed an experiment where we acquired malleable water imaging and several healthy volunteers using the two different sequences, which were uh, most of the time used. So one is the GRACE and the other the CPMG sequence. First, we generated the myelin water fraction maps with these two sequences, where the brighter the area, the higher the myelin content. Then using DTI, we estimated the fiber angle as shown before, and then computed the orientation dependency of the myelin water fraction. And here we see that this myelin water fraction has a strong orientation dependency, um, indicating that myelinated nerve fibers aligned with the fields have higher myelin water fraction values than uh, axons or myelinated axons perpendicular to the main magnetic field. And this variation was up to 35% for the GRACE sequence, for example, and also 22% for the CPMG, indicating that there is a bias when we want to estimate the myelin water fraction and therefore the myelin content, we have to keep in mind that the orientation of the fibers does influence the estimation of their myelin content. So this should be kept in mind and needs to be corrected. Then we can ask us, we saw that different quantitative methods are influenced by both iron and myelin, but can we now separate these effects on the quantitative parameters to get a more improved measurement of them? And the good thing is, yes, we can, and we have a variety of approaches available for that. But let's look again on some of the quantitative measures and the effect of iron and myelin to them. So we have here R2 star, the susceptibility and myelin water fraction. For R2 star, both an increase in iron content and also an increase in myelin content lead to an increase in R2 star. In QSM, an increase in iron content leads to an increase in the susceptibility, whereas an increase in myelin content leads to a decrease in the susceptibility. And for the myelin water fraction, both iron and myelin lead to an increase in the myelin water fraction. So we see that there are counter affecting effects of this paramagnetic iron and the diamagnetic myelin on the quantitative MR measures. And therefore, based on these physical properties, one of the potential uh, methods to separate the effects is based on temperature. This is based on Curie's law, which predicts that only the paramagnetic part of the magnetic susceptibility changes with temperature. So we heard iron is paramagnetic, myelin is diamagnetic, and so we can separate these two uh, contributions based on their temperature dependency. On the left, you see R2 prime over temperature measured in post-mortem tissue and assessed in different brain regions. In green, in the basal ganglia, red in the gray matter, cortex, and blue in white matter. And you see the stronger the decrease of R2 prime with increasing temperature, the higher the underlying iron content. So in the basal ganglia, there's the highest iron content in brain tissue. And to assess that, we performed an experiment using multiple sclerosis patients, brain tissue, and healthy uh, brain tissue, and performed post-mortem measurements at different temperatures. Then we used a simple linear regression of the acquired R2 star and the temperature at which the images were acquired to generate a so-called temperature coefficient, TCR to star, and performed the corresponding iron histology. Then we correlated the MR measures with the histologically uh, 
assessed iron content and found that with increasing iron content, TCR to star is decreasing. And we had a good correlation between this MR parameter and the ferritin count across a variety of regions, which all have a different myelin content underneath. And when we assess pure R2 star in the same areas, we saw that there's no uh, dependency or no significant correlation of R2 star with iron. When you think back to the introduction, we, we saw that in the validation study, we had a R2 star linearly increasing with iron content. But here we have a strong change in myelin content across these different brain regions, which now influence the correlation between R2 star and ferritin. A second method to separate both contributions is based on a multiparametric modeling approach. So, for example, we could combine R2 star and QSM to separate now these contributions. So here, roughly, the signal of a gradient echo sequence can be modeled or separated into a part of the paramagnetic components, diamagnetic, and neutral components. And with this uh, separation of these two substances can be achieved. Finally, a uh, third um, method which can be used to separate these uh, contributions is the in um, is depending on the orientation of the underlying tissue. So we can use the information of the orientation dependency to separate now iron and myelin effects. Therefore, we uh, developed a numerical model to simulate the MR signal in white matter, which incorporates now iron content, myelin content, and also these orientation effects. Then we simulated a variety of different um, iron and myelin contents and saw that the orientation dependent curve of R to star changes. Also, fitting of empirical wow. models for R to star is possible, which incorporate again the fiber angle, the myelin water fraction, and the iron. Wow. Based on that, we could see that iron content cha or changes in iron content contribute to the orientation independent part of R2 star. So the curves are shifted up or down, whereas the myelin content contributes to the orientation dependent part of R2 star. So with higher, or with higher myelin content, the curves get steeper. And if the myelin content decreases, the curve flattens. So based on that, we were able now to separate iron and myelin and a cohort of MS patients, siblings of MS patients and controls. So you can see here, R2 star plotted over the fiber angle for the MS group shown in green, the siblings of MS patients shown in blue and controls. And using now this developed computational model, we were able to compute whole white matter iron content which shows now that the iron content is not only different between controls and MS, but also between controls and siblings of patients with MS. On the other hand, the myelin content was clearly decreased in the MS group compared to the controls and siblings. With that, I want to sum up and I hope I could uh, show you that both iron and myelin are strong contributors to the quantitative MR parameters and maybe influence all or a large amount of these quantitative parameters. And that a single parameter such as R2 star QSM does not so lightly reflect one specific tissue constituent. But the good thing is separation of iron myelin effects can be achieved 
it is sometimes difficult, sometimes limited to post-mortem experiments, such as by using temperature effects, but it can be achieved to get an improved and uh, more precise estimation of iron or myelin content. And I hope I could show you that validation of new, but also of established quantitative MRI methods using post-mortem experiments is really essential and important because the, only this allows to uncover limitations of quantitative MRI methods and also allows to really assess the biophysical origin of these parameters and specifically of quantitative MR values in healthy but also in diseased tissue. So finally, we can ask, can we trust now the current MRI methods to quantify iron and myelin? Yes, but with specific assumptions. So we have always keep in mind the limitations of each method to get really a precise and uh, the best image analysis out of our MR experiments. But the more multi-parametric approaches show really high potential to get a more precise estimation, but also disentangle different contributions to one or to more quantitative parameters. And finally, the best thing is that these quantitative MRI techniques are a large and really active research field and there's still a lot to do and still a lot to discover in this area of quantitative MRI of the brain. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Bravo. Danke, Christoph. Um, haben, wir den, haben wir den Alex verloren? Ich glaube, ja. ja. <lacht> er ist Aber ausgestiegen. Er ist ausgestiegen <lacht> mit der Machete über die Grenze. Ja. Ja, <lacht> <lacht> um, yeah, maybe I can jump in and maybe, maybe, yes. um, maybe you know, I... You know, feel free to to everybody go on camera so we can so we can maybe jump into a little bit of a discussion. Um, um, yeah, thanks. Great, great talk. I think I think I mean I'm a little bit biased. I'm a I'm a clinical <laughs> I'm a neurologist and a, and a, and a clinical neuroscientist. So for me, it's always um, exciting to see to see um, how we can use um, methods like MRI or also others um, to you know quantitatively. Um, you know, demonstrate processes in the brain to learn more about, you know, disease, disease predisposition, process of disease, but also use it as potential biomarkers mm -hmm. in the context of trials. Um, maybe, maybe I can kick it off with, with, with one yep. obvious questions, question. So what about the iron and the siblings uh, with patients uh, of, uh, of uh, siblings of patients in, in, in MS? What's, what's, your, what's, your, what's your thought around that, that finding that you have there? Ah, oh, that's that's a good point. Uh, probably, probably that goes to a bigger question: is that what does iron do in 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 in, in MS or you know? Exactly, exactly. So I think this is most of the the information or the knowledge we have about iron in MS is based on on large and really great histological studies. But there you, you always have this, I call it endpoint. So you have the, the case subject and you can stain and compare it to healthy con tissue you have available in your biobank. And with uh, the in vivo situation, I think it's, it's sometimes really difficult, not only here as we have both an effect of iron and myelin on some measures, but also some studies, for example, showed that also atrophy influences these measures. 
And this also indicated that some atrophy, which is also cause, uh, also occurring in the cause of, of several diseases, might bias that. So if you do not include that, you could also get uh, higher or lower RT star values, which you then would interpret in higher or lower iron content. So in that particular study with, with the siblings, this was performed by a colleague in Vancouver. So they compared that and this, but this was just the first step where they showed that there's a difference. So then we would need more or different methods to go into this to really search for the underlying cause. So this would be the more complicated part. So maybe it's, it's atrophy is more advanced in this group, which was not uh, um, calculated or, or included in this computation in this case, or other changes on a, on a structural level. So, but for that, uh, we did not find some yeah some origin so far so and and, and and these brains were otherwise normal in the mri of the siblings yes i mm -hmm. i think so mm -hmm. very interesting any other questions from from the group yeah i maybe would have um the next question to the same topic um uh, the investigation of siblings is um, usually very interesting because um, they have a very close genome mm -hmm. um, and and we are assuming um, no differences uh, from the genetic background here. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, other than that, um, how many patients uh, do you investigate uh, for MRI? Is this... Um, a sufficient number in your opinion right now, or should there be more uh, sophisticated measurements for you and other colleagues in order to prove your methodology for clinical applications? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good point. The, the results shown here were really a comparison on group level because the each independent curve of each subject of course varies because there are some other effects for example age and so on which contributes to this orientation dependent curves so if you have small groups and honestly i have not the the, the, the number of subjects right in mind which we investigate here but it, if you have a small group uh, age matching is really important because this is also something which really uh, affects this on a on a subject level. So if you have a strong variety in age in in both either control or in the patient group, you would get a, a bias on top of this uh, disease effect. So. We found already some, some significant differences also in small groups, so around 10 subjects or so, if we have a really good matched control group. So you do not need really uh, hundreds. Of course, you can perform studies with hundreds of patients, which is always great to have. But if you have really a specific experiment with matched, population, you can also identify some specific effects, which is really yeah, interesting. In great, that case. great. I mean, 10 sounds great to me. I have seen clinical studies on uh, intestinal microbiota, and um, they are starting at seven to 10 uh, patients mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. What is what used to be, I think maybe uh, Dietrich knows more about this, what used mm -hmm. to be a very small number uh, mm -hmm. in biology, microbiology. Yeah. Uh, but, well, 
we developed studies and we're doing a really great job ahead of time in, in the preparation of these studies. So yeah. that's great. Uh, congratulations. Thanks. Oh, I see Alex is back. Yeah, I'm sitting now at a cafe and got, got new internet. But I'll, I'll mute myself. I'm surprised they didn't nab him at the, at the Canada-US border, right? <laughs> And I have to go drive there to bail him out. <laughs> Ouch for him. No, he is really a scientist. He's not, he's not a criminal. No, you mix it up. <laughs> I, I have a question, Christoph. Yeah. A, general, a generalist question, Gross, because I'm not a scientist, not a at least not a neuroscientist, I'm a linguist, right? But I know about your um your methodological concerns and questions about the established myelin water method. Yeah. And this reminds me of my methodological disputes with my linguistic colleagues, yeah. right? So, well, it's really a big question. So, yeah. what, what, so do you want to speak to that a little bit? And so, I think that uh, I'm not sure, but let me summarize this for sort of the, the, the non specialists. So, the idea would be that what the school claimed to be uh, measuring myelin contact um, correlated actually <laughs> with, the, with the iron content, right? So sort of that that there were two factors involved, or maybe you want to exactly. sum up a little bit better than I did. Yeah, exactly. So, so the the first hint I think Alex was curious about was that on in vivo images you saw really strong and bright myelin water fraction values in area where we know from anatomy should be less myelin, so in the deep gray metastructure. And this was already some, some clue that there is something going on. And for us, it was the intention to really look closer into that, to disentangle, is there some methodological um, effect or what is it, what is causing that behavior? And based on that, we started to think of and design uh, experiment and found this strong effect. So it was, yeah, it was really hard at the beginning because of course this, this method is validated and is used for already more than two decades, I think. And normally you cannot see such things because you, perform one validation experiment post-mortem, and then you do in vivo imaging, where you do not know the actual and real underlying uh, tissue constituents. So you have to trust your MR measures, which you get out of your method. So with that specific experiment we designed, we were able to, let's say, manipulate our tissue in different ways and to see how is our MR method performing. And of course, this is a, a specific situation in this post-mortem experiment, but I think with, with this, this check of the, the, the valid, validity of our performed experiment, we can translate the information to in vivo, highlighting that there is an effect of iron, but not saying that it is always the case. But especially in MS, where we know from pathology that both changes in iron and myelin occur, we have to keep in mind that the method has some limitations. And I think, see this more like uh, a challenge for improving stuff which which is great that we have a field that we can really drive forward so we develop something and this is not the end and it's going in can further and always yes it's very i think i think you're taking the right tack there's a method that yeah. you can improve rather than saying it was a method that actually hasn't really worked well because there, you know, there's uh, mm -hmm. multiple influential factors. But 
I, I wonder, I mean, this, your results cast doubt on the whole method. And I, I remember discussing this mm -hmm. as, as you were discovering this. And we were coming with our own, you know, methodolo uh, methodological mm -hmm. constraints from our own disciplines and comparing notes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and so I wonder, I wonder if actually the way how we do science how our system is set up, how long it takes to actually get a name for oneself and then how long to get funding and what is all connected to it. I wonder whether really our structures sort of, you know, force us to say what you are saying now, where, where you say, okay, well, this method, that's okay, but it could be better, but, you know, we need to find out more rather than saying, oh, maybe this wasn't the best method to apply the last 20 mm -hmm. years. Maybe, you know, if so, so to take a more extreme stance to really get sooner to methods that really work more precisely than, you know, so to, to get the optimal solutions at, at that. So I wonder whether our social structures or how we do something yeah. hinder that. And I mean, what you just said is is the logical conclusion for somebody who's junior in the field and wants to rise, needs to rise through the ranks, right? But I wonder if it's really, if there's something, yeah, I mean, you know, be more cautious is of course the smarter choice, but it'll delay findings, right? It'll delay insights. So, and you probably won't have an answer to this question because if you did then yeah <laughs> yeah it's really hard because yeah these validation experiments are not easy and of course if there's uh, existing method application of a method which is maybe also distributed and codes are available is of course easier if you have a large population you apply this method and find if there are differences and whatever. Uh, so this is sometimes also the easier way than working on this technological uh, aspects. But yeah, I think we need both. Also with, with methods which have some disadvantages, a lot of valuable knowledge was gained but i think the interpretation is something which can be updated in, in but several I, cases we, but we should say yeah. if, we, if we weren't human as scientists but more vulcan then we'd have a fast track to the better method <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but it's interesting it, 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 it highlights dynamics that are happening in so yeah. many so Absolutely. many scientific Absolutely. fields yeah. once once a, once a method gets established i mean i'm always get allergic or get hives when i hear the term it's a it's a validated method mm. you, know, you know validated for what in which context so yeah. so Absolutely. so it's 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 that often gets when that's been used the term it's been validated it's almost gets a stamp of dogma which which yeah. which, 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 which 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 hinders the whole field so so, so I think right. I think that's that's the that's that that's the whole issue that that with mm -hmm. this comes this bias that you do not want to kind of uh, question your own it basically it was perceived as you question the your own you know validity quote unquote of your results yeah. but that's not what this is about so right one one thing that that, that this is a nice example for is that uh, correlation is not causation right because Correct. the correlation yeah. between mile and water. Mm -hmm. uh, fraction and uh, myelin staining is very high. However, there's a biological link between myelin and iron, at least in healthy uh, brain tissue, uh, mm -hmm. that also establishes a strong correlation with iron, as, as Christoph has shown. Right? So if you change iron, you actually also change your myelin water fraction, not because of the biology, but because of the physics uh, the MRI scan works with. Right? It, both, mm -hmm. both substances have the ability to change the myelin water fraction. So people did... <laughs> These correlation experiments that found a very high correlation, then you call it validated, right? Of course, it's a, it's a good, it's, it's still a high, it's high sensitivity to iron, uh, to myelin for sure, right? And then uh, years later, uh, you know, when you look closer, you see that uh, that correlation is also linked to a correlation with iron via the biology. So I found, I found that very interesting. So uh, I think I think Irene had one more question, and then maybe yeah, one, one last um, round of questions, and then we're at the top of the hour. Um, I. I found it really interesting what Stefan said uh, that, um, uh, well, that was new to me that uh, the vision in science depends on our life uh, 
uh, Stein and our basically uh, CV and how fast we get uh, funding for development of methodologies. Um, of course, we need some money and uh, medicine um, is interested in applying highly sophisticated and validated uh, methodologies to the best of our knowledge. And we are currently developing new techniques. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, there is always uh, the outcome is the best and the wish. And, and I think that was nicely presented that it definitely works. And nowadays it always, and from the bioanalytics point of view, it always needs more than one technique and methodology. Yeah. So you yeah. always need to compare and, and yeah. things are biased by the way we can see them. And that mm -hmm. goes back to, um, I just learned about uh, microbiology. We didn't know about uh, bacteria before we actually could see them under the microscope. Um, um, so that's science, and science is development of technological um, approaches, methodologies, um, our understanding, and uh, we need to validate to the best of our knowledge. I think that's what we can do, mm -hmm. and it is great that Christoph is uh, such an outstanding expert on this, and I'm happy for him uh, being uh, a person who can uh, define results by the measurement of 10 patients point i mean that's that's really great uh, thank you <laughs> thank you. yeah i think that's really as you said the right direction also i'm really a fan of combining methods so not only having one me method or technique to investigate something but try to combine as many as possible things to really get to a point and, and also see errors or something mm -hmm. like that in advance. So yeah, I, I think, think that's really something worth going into. Good points. I'm just, I'm just also thinking we all should be aware that science is also a social activity. That, yeah. that was really important because I mean, that is that accounts for half of our findings or the delayed findings or the prevented findings or the enabled findings. And speaking of social animals, I just want to point out that this Mr. Rauscher, who's, who loves chairing Asina talks, has again been traveling while chairing an Asina talk because he did this last year in August. You know? <laughs> he had just arrived and it was always a danger where to be delayed. And like, this is a social scientist, uh, no, a, a scientist. <laughs> Who, who lives the social life of, of uh, somebody who does know how to do networking. Uh, just want to point that out. <laughs> very, very good. All right. So um, we, we're coming to the top of the hour. I mean, as we see, um, you know, Alexander Rauscher as a social animal always puts together <laughs> excellent talks. So, so this is a good, <laughs> it's a good sign. This is um, probably more than correlation. That's already potentially causation. So <laughs> the next talk, you, you have to be on, on the road again. So maybe maybe Alex, I give you the last word and then um, and then we close. Yeah, thank you. So I'm glad to be back online as I was interrupted for ten minutes or so getting off the bus and I found a cafe. So uh, <laughs> this was I saw most of it and everything that I saw was extremely exciting and I know like I think I know the rest of it as well. So this is really exciting work and I think we'll be hearing much more from Christoph in the in the, in the coming years. So thanks for giving this talk. Thank you. All right, let me stop the recording.